This guy's literally trying to start an adpocalypse because someone was mean to him. Now we're all going to lose money just because he doesn't like you. Find Get in line. <laughs> I'm really glad to have our next guest. Uh, you can follow him on the Twitter at TimCast. He's a journalist, YouTuber, podcaster. His YouTube is youtube.com slash TimCast. And he also has Tim slash TimCast News. Yep. Uh, Senor Tim, Mr. Tim Pool. How are you, sir? Thank you for being here. Pretty good. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you. I and I appreciate that Tim Pool level of enthusiasm as to how well you're pretty good. I'm okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Rather, ra I've, been, I've been called a milk toast fence sitter. So. Okay. Yeah. I, I yeah. guess I, I, I think milk toast fence sitter is redundant. I don't really know that you <laughs> you need to repeat that. I don't think you're a milk toast friend, uh, <laughs> fence sitter. I just think you're very uh, you're very mellow. This obviously um, has been going on this week. A campaign initiated by by NBC, Vox, uh, the uh, um, Carlos Maza. Yeah, I don't know what that, just the guy who does the videos at Vox. <laughs> uh, an, a, an active effort to get our channel deplatformed. Uh, even tweeting that people should go mass flag our videos. Let me ask you, you've, you've talked about sort of with Twitter, I remember on Joe Rogan's show, and it was great. I highly recommend people go check out that show. Yeah. Um, you've talked about this, and we appreciate this, the support that you've, you've given this channel uh, in regards to this controversy. How, how common is this sort of flagging, banning campaign? Or, or, or really, what would you say is, if people need to understand the dynamics of what's going on right now, because it's easy to feel like you're drinking from a fire hose when it comes to sort of corporate yeah, censorship yeah. silencing, what would you really want to drill into people? There's a very, very simple fact you can tell people to prove 100 percent the social media platforms are biased against conservatives and it's their misgendering policy. Progressives are a very are, are progressives don't represent the entirety of the left, according to the Hidden Tribes report by a group. I believe it's called a group called More in Common. Progressive activists in the U.S. are 8 percent of the country. It's these people primarily who who view the misgendering thing the way Twitter does, that if someone decides to have a preferred pronoun, you have to use it. Otherwise, you can be banned. Conservatives tend to disagree, you know, the majority, I would say. I mean, Ben Shapiro is much, much opposed to way more than just the idea of misgendering. But, you know, in terms of the trans debate, women and uh, com uh, yeah. trans women competing in sports. He almost got if, headlocked by an angry transgender for doing yeah. that. Yeah. Um, is that, was that on that show where they? Th she, the yeah, Dr. Drew was Zoe, Zoe Tour who threatened to put him in home in an ambulance. <laughs> yeah. Horrible, horrible so, experience. It's, it plays no role in political discourse, but wildly right. entertaining. Yeah. So, so just look at the rules. And and I told this to Jack Dorsey, full stop. You are biased against conservatives, and he didn't understand this. I said, listen, if a conservative doesn't believe you're, you know, in misgendering the way you do, you have an ideological difference where you're enforcing rules based on your personal ideology. He went on to say, well, we have studies we've read that show the suicide rate is higher, therefore we're trying to protect them. And I asked, what about, you know, d general body dysmorphia? Are, you know, at what point do you draw a line and say, this group should or shouldn't be protected? Right. You know, can you not make fun of depression because people who are depressed have the highest rate of suicide? That's literally, you know, par particularly. Actually, it's not higher person. than transgenders. That's actually something that's, oh, that's it's not. No, it's not. It's actually not. Oh, there, wow. There's no other demographic that I know to be as high outside of, from what I understand, like paranoid schizophrenics. Even Ben Shapiro has made this point. American slaves didn't have nearly as high of an attempted suicide rate. If I'm not mistaken, it's about 41, yeah. 42%, yeah, 41. both pre and post-op, by the way. So um, this idea that it's societally sort of based oppression, it just doesn't bear out. But yeah, it's actually a higher rate than, than those who would be considered like even manic depressive. That, that, I would say that's the easiest thing you can say, right? It's, it's not a debate. You point that out and people are gonna go, oh, I guess you're right. Now, the people on the left, the progressives say, so what you're saying is that conservatives are mad they can't misgender people. And it's like, well, hold on. They view misgendered in an, in an inverse way. They believe that if someone is biologically male and you say she, you have misgendered them, right? right. So it's literally just, you, I don't know how you rectify that. There's two different ideologies here, and only one. It's only enforced in one direction. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. That is a great. That is a great point. And also this idea of, I think you see it sort of to get back to this NBC Vox thing. Let me ask you this: Have you ever seen people on the right, or people like I know that I've never done this, but how common is it to see people on the right to encourage mass flagging and removals of points of view they disagree with? I'm not familiar it with it. Happens, but it's extremely, extremely rare. Right. And so you know, this is another thing that puts me kind of more on your side in an issue like this. I get people tweeting at me saying, oh, here comes Tim to defend the conservative. I'm like, well, Steven Crowder isn't calling for someone to have their career destroyed simply because they said something mean on the internet. Right. You know, in fact, you've actually told people not to dox, not to harass. So it's kind of like, you can't have Carlos Maza advocating for throwing milkshakes at people to humiliate them and then complaining about someone saying mean words that humiliates him. Right. I mean, we're 
Yeah, fairness. One is an act. By the way, throwing a milkshake at someone is is actually assault. Yeah, that legally. is it is it is battery. legally assault. Yeah, actually, you're right. It's further than assault. It's actually battery. Yeah. Um, and people who say, well, milkshakes haven't really hurt you. Actually, that's not true. People can put anything in a milkshake. First off, people can hide something heavy in there and whip it at you. People can put acid in there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've always said, uh, I've always condemned doxing because I was doxed at one point. I am actually on the ISIS kill list. It's not people that's saying correct. mean things. I've been in communication with the FBI. Yeah. Not only that, there's so many people on the FBI kill list when I. I spoke with people at the FBI, they're like, eh, almost everyone makes that list. Like, but there is an ultra premium list, sort of the elite flyers club. They're like, and you're at the top of that. VIP. So list. here's our number. <laughs> um, I've always actively discouraged it. I never yeah. want any uh, physical viol violence. And that was another thing Jack Dorsey spoke with you about, physical safety, whether it's doxing, whether it's milkshaking. Uh, but this, this idea that mass flagging and reporting something to get it removed, um, it oh, really I got, is, I got, yeah. I, I can, I, I got one better for you. Okay. One of one of the there's, there's a body of journalistic ethics from this uh, the Society for Professional Journalists. If you go to J school, you probably know this, but apparently these people who work at Vox don't. It's called minimize harm. Mm -hmm. When you when you when you seek to do a story, if if revealing information about your subject would cause them harm, you do your best to avoid that. Which means, if I heard that a group of people who were very very awful and dangerous were using a certain company. I would reach out to the company without naming them because it's not my position as a journalist to cause harm to them or anyone, but more importantly, to interfere in the story and make the story, you know, change the story as a result of my actions. Okay. When a journalist goes down to cover something on the ground, you should not be putting your body in the way to change what happens. You're trying to tell people what happens, not cause the reaction. Right. However, what happens now is I actually have evidence of this. Uh, I, re I received some leaked documents. We'll see what I, if, if I can do anything with it. Journalists use very fanciful language targeting businesses and companies to cause maximum harm to specific individuals. So they're not seeking to, when they report on say the Proud Boys, they're not seeking to inform the audience as to what's going on. They're seeking to inflict damage on the business and the Proud Boys. Mm. What they'll do is they'll say something like this. Let's say you're a, a laundromat. They see a Proud Boy go inside the laundromat. They wait till the person leaves, they'll go inside, go up to the manager and say, the Proud Boys are white supremacists. Why do you support white supremacists? And then the, the, the manager goes, well, I, I, what, are you, what are you talking about? Of course I don't. Well, of course you do. And so they'll send a message to a company saying, why do you support X? Mm -hmm. Instead of asking them if they do, they assume it is true. And then, man, I have seen these hit pieces go flying. But the best part is, they don't, uh, so I'll give you an example. CNN, for instance, reached out to Facebook about a group called Mavic Media. Mavic Media is anti-war left-wing content mm -hmm. aimed at millennials. And they're, uh, I believe, 51% owned by Ruptly, which is funded by Russia Today. CNN reaches out to Facebook and says, why are you is supporting Is that those big, big ladies who do the, that's BuzzFeed boldly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Sorry, I apologize. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. Mavic is very much like no intervention in Syria, things like that, you okay. know, so. Uh, but they, they, CNN reached out to Facebook, and I don't know exactly what they asked, but I, in my personal opinion, I imagine it was something like, why is Facebook supporting Russian propaganda? Because what ends up happening is Facebook then suspended the media company who broke no rules, and it wasn't until after the suspension does CNN publish the story, Mavic Media suspended by Facebook because they're owned by Russia, blah, blah, right. blah. That's not what journalism is supposed to be doing. So you actually have left-wing activists who have gotten jobs because it's lucrative for the companies. And they're not trying to learn; they're trying to impact. Right. You know, that, that's that's. You look at Jim Acosta. He's, he straight up says he grandstands. That's the point. Right. You know, so they're trying. Well, he says that now, and that's changed. the thing. For the longest time, yeah. he tried to feign that he was objective. And I've always said this idea that there's this death of objective journalism. If you go back to Walt, Walter Cronkite and actually read what he's written and see what his quotes were, he said, "I don't think you can be a journalist and not be a liberal." For a long time, we thought he was my god, an actual <laughs> journalist. People are inherently biased. I don't believe in any golden era of unbiased journalism. I just think that now it's more clear. And and to me, that's somewhat a good thing because at least we know where the lines are drawn. I wish right. it it weren't so polarized, but it is. Um, and that's a very interesting point that you, you bring up there. There's also been a real transition because you talk about it being financially viable with Vox and this Carlos Maza where now uh, they've shifted from myself, Vox, to the targeting of advertisers on YouTube. And a lot of other yep. YouTubers, people who would not support me at all politically, yeah. are pretty upset by this. I think that's where they may have screwed the pooch. Um, have you been following this and is this kind of a common tactic? Yeah, yes. So the, the video I, I have earlier today kind of talks about how Carlos Maza, in his interview with AM2DM, uh, AM I think it's called, on BuzzFeed, 
he said he, he gets to the point where he talks about how, you know, you're harassing all that stuff, but then says, you know, what? it's not you. It's that YouTube is distracting the advertisers from the fact that they can't control their platform and their advertisements appear on, you know, hateful, bigoted, homophobic content, et cetera, et cetera. And I saw a tweet from Keemstar who does drama alert on YouTube. It's like YouTube culture stuff. And he said, this guy's literally trying to start an adpocalypse because someone was mean to him. Now we're all going to lose money just because he doesn't like you. Yeah. So this, this is what I find Get interesting. Get in line. <laughs> Look, whole digital list. media has been hurting, right? Uh, Vice, literally right now, I just pulled up a story. Vice just fired two of its longtime editors, someone who's been with the company for 10 years. They've had layoffs. CNN just laid off their London staff. CNN just put their freelance, their contractors on a net 90. Yeah. That means if you work for them, they won't pay you for three months. That's financing mm-hmm. your staff. That's crazy. Right. So look, a lot of these companies are hurting. All of a sudden, very conveniently, you know, uh, a story came out from Vox not a couple weeks ago where they acknowledge their evaluation is probably down from their initial ev- investment. We just saw a story where Vox is now switching to freelancers and part timers which to many is indicative of them hurting. We don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to accuse Vox of failing or anything like that. But then all of a sudden, Carlos Maza comes out. You've criticized him before, but it's, it's now. It's now that, and then he, he advances his argument to talk about advertisers instead of you, and he's right. using his identity to hmm. target the platform as a whole, accusing it of being an alt-right haven. I find it, I find it fascinating that he's playing the victim here, that he's the, the little guy being oppressed when he actually is one of the most prominent figures on a, a channel with, with you know, what's uh, 40 well, And keep, keep in mind, too, this is also one thing you talked about. Like, we have, you know, close to 4 million. They have close to 6 million. But the very first mm-hmm. Vox rebuttal that we've done, which, by the way, include, on average, I think, about 8 to 12 times the yeah. sources that are publicly listed that Vox oh, yeah. never does than yeah. they than, than they do, um, we might have had less than half a million subscribers. So oh, yeah. it's not like we were right. punching down. We were going after the biggest channel because we're going, hold on a second, they support the right. Australian gun buyback. We're going to rebut that. And again, Hours and hours of content. People need to know. A tossed in aside of lispy gay yeah. Latino from Joke. Vox. If people want to watch the videos in their entirety, listen, we can have the conversation that conservatives shouldn't be allowed to do comedy. I didn't call him a c- holster. I didn't call him a feckless c- yeah. I think it was positively tame. That's just my opinion. But it's no, there, there's no doubt that there's a, subs, uh, a substantial rebuttal to the arguments made over there at Vox. And by the way, we've done it with Vox when it wasn't this guy. We did it when it was that Ezra Klein guy and yeah. Vice. It's about 1% of our content. So that's what bothers me is, is the dishonesty and people taking something that's been going on for a long time when we were a channel that was very small and uh, actually really punching back at the bully. Right. So, so here's the way I kind of see it. Uh, when it comes to political discourse, I discourage mockery, name calling, whatever. However, Sure. I recognize you're a comedian. You're not a journalist. You know, when, when Tucker Carlson called Brian Stelter a eunuch, I, I pushed back on that in several videos. Like, I do not think that's appropriate. In, in your instance, you're right. You know, feckless cons, um, holster and things like that have been done. We've seen way more egregious stuff on the left. But it's not about uh, a tit for tat. It's kind of uh, John Stewart, Trevor Noah, John Oliver. They routinely mock and, and, and target people at or above their level. Sure. And Carlos Maza gets a million views per video. He's not some random nobody small guy being punched down. Yeah. You're a guy who's mocking him and doing a comedy bit. If if he was if he was a private citizen that you, and you know and he posted a, a a video of Nancy Pelosi, I'd have some criticism for you. But he's not. Right. He's yeah. a very he's he's I would I would argue he's extremely powerful with nearly with nearly a hundred thousand subscribers, a million views per video, having access to six million subs in a in a company that's funded to the tune of two hundred million dollars by NBC. It's my understanding. Yeah, that's so just that's not, just the NBC Universal investment. Yeah, that doesn't include any I, of the other investors. Which is why I wonder, like, how did you lose all this money? <laughs> how where did it go? I mean, two hundred million. What? How many? How many strike throughs are you guys doing? We only see one every two weeks. Yeah. Um, it is. It is really remarkable. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I think um, also people hopefully know. You know, when we do a change of mind, or even if you look at the leftists who we've had in this show, we've uh, I've uh, had conversations with or debated, and it's gotten heated from Naomi Wolf yeah. to Sally Cohn to mm-hmm. Christopher Titus to the guy from Think Progress, the guy from Slate or Salon. I've never insulted them. There's a difference when you know, you're doing a bit and you're talking with someone, and I've yeah. always tried to delineate because, I, I, listen, I really, the last thing I would ever want is to pick on someone and be rude to them in person when they've do, uh, give, uh, you know, done me the courtesy of, of appearing on the program. I feel like uh, I've, made, I've made several videos, so my, my second channel, which is the Timcast News one, where I regularly talk about fairness and rights. I made a video recently, you have no rights, the world is cruel and unfair. And I talked about the woman in Hawaii who fell 20 feet, broke her leg, and had to drag herself to the stream and eat moths and drink dirty water to survive. 
I'd like to, I'd like to ask many of the progressives where was her her right to health care? Is there is there is there anyone who's well, she certainly had a right to speech, defense, freedom of movement, etc. So probably why I'm not you know overtly liberal or progressive is because I'm not 100 percent on board with saying health care is a human right. Mm-hmm. Then the other story was uh, Mount Everest where you had all this crowding, and I and I ask when uh, in one of the stories they said people were collapsing because they ran out of oxygen. Do you think any of those people said, "Here, take mine"? Of course not, right. because when it came down to the, the harshness, the harsh realities of the world, people had to secure their own face mask before securing the mask of the people next to them. So I see someone like Carlos Maza who calls for physical attacks on people. It's a milkshake. I think it's really low level, but still, you're t- you're saying make physical contact with another person in violation of their autonomy. That's that's an egregious violation. But then he gets mad that someone said mean words to him, and so here's where I end up. Do I, do I think we get anywhere with mockery and, and, and insults? Of course not. I think it's detrimental. However, people call me things all day, every day, and I'm an adult. i it not really bothered. You can call me literally whatever you want. I opened the segment by saying I'm a milk toast fence sitter, and I think it's funny. And I would actually like to do the web <laughs> extended here. But so let me, before we go to the web yeah. extended, let's go back to this um, kind of trend of big journalism, big tech uh, on a national level. Let me ask you this. Do you think that this trend is going to reverse? Do you think there's hope for people who are sort of uh, free speech advocates on places like YouTube and social media? Or do you just see these places kind of eating themselves alive? I, I kind of go back and forth on this when it's tough. I will say with the with the EFF, coming out now saying we have to deal with this. That's some, that's really good news. I also think regulation is coming and regulation can only ratchet in one direction as it pertains to free speech. I don't know if uh, wider regulation of Facebook, Google, Twitter, et cetera, would result in something positive. What I do know is as far as it goes with free speech, any regu- uh, regulation implemented in terms of speech will guarantee the right to speech. So we've already seen the Supreme Court rule that these, these digital spaces, the government cannot restrict your access to them. Now we've seen with that Trump lawsuit, public officials can't block you. And this is now, now you know, biting Ocasio-Cortez. But Tlaib has me she, blocked right now. Yeah. She can't. That's illegal. You can file a suit. You can. Uh, the, Knight, the Knight First Amendment uh, uh, Foundation, I'm not sure. Uh, Knight Foundation's journalism, they're, they're based out of Columbia Journalism School. Uh, they, they tweeted to Ocasio-Cortez she was running afoul of the First Amendment. They deleted the tweet because, you know, these people rarely like to police their own. But right. uh, they did. Well, actually, I did that back. They sometimes eat their own too much. Yeah. But I think that's really good news. I think I think regulation. Look, here, here's another po- point where I'm probably to the, you know, to the left of you. I'm, I think regulation will absolutely be a good thing in this regard and in many other regards. So, um, no, I I'm, don't I'm think I, I don't think so. Um, I've talked about this and my position has, has, has been pretty clear. I think the first step before we get to sweeping legislative overhaul, and this is what I've been advocating for a long time. The first step is to get them basically in a court of law and to declare whether they are publishers or platforms. Put them in the hot seat. And if they say we are platforms, then we say, OK, we're going to regulate but, you as such. But if they say they're publishers, we say, OK. But then you have to be honest about your business practice. I think it's an easier but, first step. Yeah. But it's actually uh, the platform versus publisher has to do with whether with uh, whether or not they can be sued for libel. And the, the, the reason they're able to ban anyone they want is actually a First Amendment issue. And that's, that's where it's complicated because Twitter is arguing Everything on our platform is our speech, and you can't make us speak. Right. And they're right. So if the government rules, Twitter has a massive impact on the political space, the news space, and our government. Therefore, free speech for the individual must be protected. Then Twitter opens the doors and allows people back on the platform. I don't necessarily know if it's the right thing to do. I lean towards that direction. But I also recognize you will end up seeing ridiculous trolling going crazy. At the same time, you have the ability to block and by all means, use it liberally, you know? Yeah. So, but, but I still think, uh, again, that would that would at least open the doors to know what the policies are. And uh, like you said, if they want to declare that they're, they are publishers, they should be held liable. In other words, and if right now you are policing speech, if right now you're saying this point of view is allowed, but calling a biological male, he is not, it's a bannable offense. Well, if you are now a, uh, a publisher, it does have to be congruent with the law and that, okay, you can be held legally responsible for that speech on your publishing platform. Now, if you want to say you're basically a mm-hmm. platform, what people often sort of refer to as social utility, public utilities, which is, they've enjoyed some of those protections. That's why you can't necessarily sue them right now. They do have to pick a lane. And before we say, we're going to legislate them as either a publisher or a platform, I think having them answer um, would be a good first, less expensive, less invasive step. And uh, I think uh, they'd have to start straightening up and fly right. Okay, let me, before we go to the web extended here, okay, go ahead. You were about to say something. I was going to say the bigger problem is cultural. That our, our business, our private institutions are extremely susceptible and weak to low-grade activism. 
30 people on Twitter complaining to a brand and that brand loses, you know, goes, goes apeshit and shuts everything down. And our businesses need to become more resilient to a bunch of, you know, people on Twitter. Yeah, well, that also brings me to this last point. We can touch on it, and then we'll uh, continue the web extended. You know, you've talked about this this, this sort of trend too of um, targeting when people talk about bullying. Big news media, big corporate, these corporate conglomerates targeting individuals at a national level. We saw it with the Covington kids, like you mentioned. I think yeah. you mentioned. Did you mention Daily Beast and the guy who created oh, the Nancy yeah. Pelosi video? Um, oh, yeah, CNN yeah. just recently. I mean, this is something. It does seem like that. There's been an acceleration recently where they don't seem to mind at all doxing individual people or violation of privacy rights. Yeah, that's called maximizing harm. It's the complete opposite of ethical journalism. You know, uh, even the, Yashir Ali is a is a great journalist, and he I, I love when he calls them out for this. He said publishing this guy's name did nothing for the story. Absolutely nothing. They published his photograph. They 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 published his criminal history. None of that. None of that is relevant. They could have talked about how they found the guy and he comes from, you know, working class means. That's interesting. But why why should you ruin this guy's life? It's because it's punishment. It's it's a threat. These are this is activism. It's maximizing the harm against a private individual who has no chance of fighting against a massive multi-billion dollar corporation. Right. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And I think um the sort of, I guess, equalizing factor there, for example, with us and Vox is, yeah, they are this massive corporation with hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, we started out of our, uh, you know, started out of my den, but having that platform and having a voice is equally or comparably as valuable, and that's why they want to silence the voice. It's, it's leveled the playing field a little bit. All right, we're going to go to a web extended. That is, though, youtube.com slash Tim Pool. Is it, Tim, sorry, not Tim, 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 Tim Cast, Cast and Tim Cast News, and you are on Twitter at TimCast. Tim yeah. Poole, thank you so much. Hey there, if you like this video, this is the part where I would usually tell you to subscribe, but... I can't do it anymore. I'm going to tell you to subscribe, and then YouTube is going to decide that we can't reach you, even though you subscribe to this channel, and then I'll say hit the notification bell, and then the notification bell won't even be there anymore. I don't know what to say. More than likely, you'll find my face in a milk carton. But do what you can to stop it. It's just, it's just, it probably won't do much.